In the heart of a snowstorm, the night had swallowed the road, save for the cones of light cast from the beams of a solitary car. Jacob was that solitary driver, pushing his weary eyes to focus as the car cut through the blizzard. The wipers fought valiantly against the onslaught of snow, a losing battle as the world turned white. As the clock's hands crawled towards midnight, something darted into the road's halo of visibility. It was not a deer. It was too large. Too. Wrong. It moved with disjointed limbs, shambling, yet its eyes captured the headlight's gleam with an intelligent awareness that sent ice through Jacob's veins. He swerved instinctively. Tires lost their battle with the icy asphalt and the car spun, a graceful yet terrifying pirouette, before plunging into a snowbank. The world jolted to an abrupt halt, and for a moment there was only the sound of Jacob's breathing and the car's engine ticking as it cooled. He tried the engine. It groaned but was firmly lodged in the snow's grasp. His phone, his lifeline, showed no signal. Jacob was alone, or so he wished. Outside, something moved. It wasn't the wind-sculpted snow nor the branches of burdened trees. It was the creature, a silhouette against the storm, just beyond the headlight's reach. Jacob squinted, hoping it was a trick of his strained eyes, but the figure was unmistakable. It was watching him. A sound emerged from the howling wind, something akin to laughter, but wrong. It was as if the sound itself was being torn through the fabric of reality, a mirthless, grating cacophony that clawed at Jacob's sanity. Panic set in, a primal urge to flee, but where to? The storm was a beast itself, and the creature outside was its sentinel. Jacob's breaths came in ragged gasps, his hands trembling on the steering wheel. The thing moved closer, its form clearer now in the cruel illumination. It was a patchwork of nightmares, limbs too long, fingers ending in talons, and a face that was too human to belong to whatever unholy flesh it wore. Its mouth twisted, contorting in ways that defied nature, as that hideous laughter burrowed into Jacob's ears. Then it stopped, inches from the glass, its breath fogging the window as it pressed what might have been its face against it, searching for a way in. Jacob could see now in its eyes an abyss of malice. It tapped the glass with one elongated finger, a soft, rhythmic, terrifying sound. Terror rooted him to his seat, his voice a prisoner in his throat. The tapping grew more insistent, a crack appearing where the creature's finger struck with unnatural strength. As the glass spider webbed from the pressure, Jacob's paralysis broke. In a desperate scramble, he reached for the glove compartment, pulling out a flare gun his father had insisted he keep. With trembling hands, he loaded it. The glass wouldn't hold much longer. With the creature's face merely a pain away, Jacob aimed the flare gun and fired. The flare's red light filled the night, blinding both him and the creature as the glass finally gave way. The storm swallowed the sound of shattering glass. Jacob's heartbeat was a deafening drum roll in the silence that followed. The creature had vanished, and the storm seemed to have calmed its rage, as though its entertainment was over. Hours passed, or it might have been minutes. Time was a lost cause in that car, stuck in the snow until lights approached from the road. Rescuers found Jacob, the flare gun's grip fused to his hands, his eyes wide with an unspoken horror. They said he was lucky to be alive, given the severity of the storm, but Jacob knew better. As he lay in the hospital bed that night, he heard it again, the soft tapping against the window, and that terrible inhuman laughter lost in the howling of the wind. What had begun as a mere drive in the snow had ended as a chilling testament to the mysteries that lurked beyond the beaten path and a reminder that some things in this world defy the comfort of explanation. In the heart of the night, under a sliver of a waning moon, Mark's car glided along the desolate stretch of Interstate 90. His eyes were heavy, fighting the hypnotic dance of the broken white lines that flickered in the glow of his headlights. The drive had been monotonous, the endless expanse of darkness only broken by the occasional distant lights of a passing truck. The car's cabin was filled with the soft hum of the engine and the faint rustle of the night wind as it caressed the edges of his window. The radio had lost its signal hours ago, leaving Mark in a cocoon of solitude. That's when he first heard it. A whisper. So faint, he thought his weary mind was playing tricks on him. He shook his head attributing it to the wind. But the whisper came again, a little louder this time, a sibilant hiss that seemed to form words, but nothing Mark could decipher. His heart quickened, a jolt of adrenaline cutting through the fog of his fatigue. 
He checked the rearview mirror reflexively. The back seat lay empty, bathed in shadows. Keep it together, Mark, he murmured to himself, chalking it up to sleep deprivation. He rolled down the window, letting the cold air whip through the car, clearing his mind. The whisper subsided, and he breathed a sigh of relief. Miles passed, and with each one the tension in his shoulders began to ease. But as the car ate away the distance, the whisper returned. This time it was persistent, growing louder, more insistent. It was no longer a random hiss, but a clear, articulate voice, speaking in a language he didn't understand, yet it carried a malevolent intent that needed no translation. Mark's eyes flickered to the mirror again, still nothing. The impossibility of the situation clawed at his sanity. The voice was now a cacophony, multiple whispers layering upon each other, as if a crowd were hiding just out of sight, speaking in a tongue that was ancient and arcane. He slammed his foot on the brake, the car screeching to a halt on the shoulder. The whispers stopped abruptly, leaving only the sound of his heavy breathing and the car's protesting engine. Mark sat in silence, waiting, but there was nothing. No whispers, no wind, not even the distant call of a nocturnal bird. Just silence. With trembling hands, he reached for the door, the need to escape the confines of the car overwhelming. But as he touched the handle, the whisper returned, this time in his ear, as if spoken by someone leaning close, intimately close. Don't look, it hissed. Mark froze, the words echoing in his skull. Against every instinct screaming inside him, he turned slowly to the back seat. His eyes met only the empty car, but as he turned back, the mirror showed something new, a fleeting shadow, a distortion in the glass. He blinked and the shadow was gone, but the whisper grew to a shout, filling the car with a desperate, hungry energy. Mark felt a coldness seep into his bones, a chill that had nothing to do with the night air. It was inside him now, the voice, as if it had found a home within the hollows of his mind. He fled from the car, the door left swinging open as he ran into the open, the bare fields on either side of the highway offering no shelter. The whispers followed, carried on the wind, circling him, closing in. In the darkness, Mark ran blindly, the ghostly voices driving him forward, until his foot caught on an unseen obstacle and he fell to the ground. As he looked up, the whispers ceased, but the silence was more terrifying. Above him, the stars seemed to wink out one by one, and the darkness descended upon him like a shroud. When the state trooper found Mark's car the next morning, engine still running, door wide open, there was no sign of him. The only evidence that he had existed at all was the indentation in the back seat, where it looked as if someone or something had been sitting. Mark was never seen again, but sometimes late at night drivers on Interstate 90 speak of whispers carried on the wind, and a figure seen running through the fields, always ahead never reaching the safety of the lights. Amid the endless stretch of highway slicing through the heartland, there's a rumor of a place only spoken about in hushed tones by truckers and midnight roadsters. They call it the Last Stop Diner, and it's said to only appear when the veil between day and night grows thin, just as the clock's hands converge on midnight. Tom was a skeptic, a man of reason, not given to the fanciful tales of weary travelers. His job as a sales representative had him driving through this stretch countless times, and he always scoffed at the myth. That was until tonight, a night where the moon hung low and full, and a thick mist caressed the black asphalt. With a yawn stretching across his face and the last gas station miles behind him, Tom squinted at the unexpected neon glow piercing through the fog ahead. Last stop diner, it read the sign buzzing as if it were alive. A wave of relief washed over him. Food, coffee, and perhaps some conversation might be the respite he needed. Parking his car between a shiny, vintage Cadillac and a mud-splattered motorcycle, Tom noticed an odd silence in the air, a stillness that seemed out of place. Shrugging off a prickling sense of unease, he pushed through the diner's doors. The diner was a slice of Americana lost in time, with a jukebox in the corner playing a tune from a bygone era, and a checkered floor reflecting the red neon sign. The patrons were an odd assortment, a young couple in leather jackets, 
sharing a milkshake with two straws, a man in a gray suit reading a newspaper dated from 1952, a little girl, no older than seven, quietly nibbling on a slice of apple pie. Tom took a seat at the counter, and a waitress sauntered over, her smile a little too wide. What'll it be, hun? She asked, her voice a melody of a distant past. Coffee, black, and whatever's good, Tom replied, trying to shake the chill that danced up his spine. The pie, it's on the house tonight, the waitress beamed, her eyes hollow pools of nothingness. Special occasion. He watched as she deftly poured coffee into a chipped porcelain mug and served him a generous slice of apple pie. It was delicious, unnaturally so. The sweetness of the apples tinged with a flavor he couldn't place. Glancing around, Tom realized the diner had no doors leading back outside. The windows showed only the inky abyss of the night. A creeping dread began to fill him as he noticed the patrons staring at him with solemn gazes, their meals untouched. Enjoying the pie? The waitress's voice sliced through the growing silence. Tom nodded, his mouth suddenly too dry. It's an old family recipe, she continued. People say it's to die for. Something in her tone made Tom's heart race. He pushed the plate away, suddenly desperate to leave. That's when he noticed his car keys were missing from his pocket. Looking for these? The waitress held them up, her smile never faltering. You can leave any time you like, hun, but most folks find they want to stay. Until the very end. Tom bolted up, the other patron's eyes tracking his every move. He stumbled toward where the entrance should be, but there was only a smooth wall. The jukebox crackled and switched tunes, the song eerie and familiar, a melody his mother used to hum to lull him to sleep. How could it know? You can stay with us, the little girl said, her voice ancient and cold. We're all just waiting to finish our last meal. It was then that Tom noticed the detail he had missed before. The patrons were translucent, their forms shimmering faintly with each note that spilled from the jukebox. He turned back to the waitress, pleading, What is this place? She leaned in, the diner falling into an abyssal silence as she whispered, It's where the lost find themselves. You were tired, running on fumes. It was only a matter of time before you joined us. The horror of realization dawned on Tom as a spectral trucker beside him chuckled. Welcome to the last stop, buddy. You can never leave until you've finished your meal. Tom's scream was drowned out by the jukebox as he sat back down, an invisible force guiding him. The pie, once sweet, now tasted of ash and sorrow. A glimpse outside revealed the mist had cleared, the diner visible on a bend notorious for its fatal accidents. The waitress's laughter echoed as the scene outside the window shifted to daylight, the diner vanishing with the rising sun. And there, just on the bend, lay Tom's car, wrapped around a pole, the remnants of his last journey. The last stop diner, faded from existence, its patrons waiting in eternal hunger, while the new arrival sat forever, hoping for a morning that would never come. <laughs>